Am I the a-hole for telling my daughter to get over herself? I was blessed with three beautiful children, and unfortunately my eldest, Brooke, passed away when she was five years old. It rocked my world, but I know I haven't been the same since. I went through therapy and still attend to this day, but a part of me died too. I will never let my daughter be forgotten. I bring pictures of her to events such as holiday celebrations and birthdays. I talk about her all the time. Every year on my living children's birthdays, I think of her and how her once younger siblings are now older than her. My other daughter, Marnie, is getting married next month. I asked her if she was having a memorial table and she said no. I asked her about creating a seat for her sister who passed as she should be a part of the day. Marnie told me no, that for once she wants a day about her. She says she couldn't have one event that wasn't about Brooke. Even her graduation, I had put a picture of her on the seat. She said I needed to stop making my grief front stage. I told her she was being incredibly selfish. And until she goes through a loss like this, she'll never understand. Marnie asked me if her kids would have to live under the shadow of Brooke too. And I told her she should be ashamed to get over herself. My son says I'm being terrible and I need to reevaluate my life. Am I the a-hole? Now for the top comments. You do realize that you've made your living children feel like they don't matter, right? You're the a-hole. I cannot imagine your loss, but you've hurt your two living children by never allowing them to move on. And in your fear of having Brooke forgotten, you have ensured that they resent her memory. I understand wanting to keep a loved one's memory alive, but there is a time, place, and prioritization for it. It's disrespectful to the living children too, for the lack of a better word, obsessed with someone who is no longer here. Opie's life revolves around a deceased daughter so much, so that it's sickeningly offensive for Opie to put the other children second place. I'm not gonna sugarcoat my words just cause Opie's grieving. I don't like Opie at all. She's not a good or even a decent mother to her children right now. Maybe in the future as well. The other children don't have the same bond to Brooke as Opie does. They should not be subjected to Opie's obsession. I'm sure the children feel the need to compete with their dead sister for a fraction of their mother's attention. They should miss her. Pain leads to happy memories. Why would they want to forget their sister? Even her graduation, I had put a picture of her on the seat. Is Marnie happy? No. She wants her grief out of her life. I want to quasi-hijack this understandably harsh comment to add, because I know people who started therapy because of behavioral patterns that harmed their loved ones had a misfortune of finding a really crappy therapist and got much, much worse. Holy smokes. Get a new therapist. I want to offer sympathetic and productive advice to Opie. And the most generous thing I can assume about her is that she spent several decades seeing a wildly incompetent therapist. He was completely disinterested in helping Opie have meaningful relationships with the living, or even understanding what such a thing might be. I'm going to be blunt, Opie, because apparently your own children telling you you're terrible is not enough to get through to you. Most bad parents only manage to sow discord between their living children. You've accomplished the rare feat of causing the living to resent the dead. If you do not believe in an afterlife, then it follows that none of what you are doing to remember Brooke is actually for Brooke. It's for you. Stop being selfish. If you do believe in an afterlife, then surely you understand that Brooke doesn't want a table at Marnie's wedding. She wants a place in Marnie's heart. That's not going to happen until you stop turning all of your kids' important life events into a decades-long memorial for Brooke. You're the a-hole. None of what you are doing to remember Brooke is actually for Brooke. It's for you. Over and over this. Can you imagine that you are at your graduation and your mother requests an empty chair to put your sister's photo who died over a decade or two ago? My 20-year-old brother ended himself and it consumed my dad. He didn't care about me or anyone else. All he cared about was my brother. It's pretty rough when your parents' favorite kid is their dead one. You're the a-hole. I say this with the most love I can muster, but you are the one who needs to get over yourself. Next story. Am I the a-hole for choosing my son over my stepdaughter? I, female 32, have been married to Mark, male 36, for six years. Mark had a child, Sarah, female 12, with Allie, ex-girlfriend, who is starting high school next year, meaning she needs a computer for school. We also have a child together, Alex, male 5. The issue arose last week when my husband asked me to contribute one-third of the cost for Sarah's computer, saying it could be a Christmas present for all of us. Sarah wants a MacBook. 
and they decided on the latest MacBook Pro. Over $2,000 after Apple Care, accessories, etc., with my share totaling at least $700. I make significantly less than my husband, and before this year, we would stick to a budget and have the cost together. This year, the budget I scheduled was $200 per kid. I typically handle all Christmas shopping, but run everything past Mark. I told Mark that was double what we spent each Christmas, and I wasn't aware until now that I was expected to chip in the costs. I said if I'd had time to save, I might have, but in short notice, it wasn't possible and suggested we look at cheaper options, which was quickly shot down. I told him that I could contribute $200 for my savings, but no more so we still had to buy presents for Alex. This wasn't received well by Sarah, Allie or Mark, and they said I was selfish for not helping out, and Sarah was devastated as she took this as me favoring Alex over her and not liking slash wanting her. The suggestion was that I don't spend much money on Alex and give the money to Sarah instead, but I refused since I didn't consider that fair to Alex and didn't want him upset that he didn't get any slash many presents for Christmas. This has had a severe impact in my relationship with Sarah and Allie, and Mark thinks I should do this to prove my love for Sarah. Sarah has three people contributing to presents while Alex only has two, so Sarah typically gets more presents anyway, but we always keep things fair. Mark and Allie are the a-hole for getting Sarah involved in an issue of finances. She's 12 years old. She does not need a $2,000 piece of equipment. Let them get it for her and see what happens when she breaks it. The fact that he equates sticking to a budget with not caring as much about Sarah is a huge red flag as well. Not day home. However, keep your eye on your husband and his ex playing their daughter against you. You won't be the a-hole if you play into their game at your son's expense. I would just like to point out that most high schools issue their own computers to students. My kid is in high school and they gave out iPads for the students at the beginning of the school year. So this isn't a need, it's a want, and an expensive want for a 12-year-old. Not day home. Why does a 12-year-old need a MacBook Pro in the first place? I got through university with a laptop I got open box at Best Buy for $400. It sounds as though he tried reasonable compromises and suggestions, and it's pretty rude of them to have involved her in this conversation. Good luck entangling this mess, and I hope the adults can reach some kind of agreement without spoiling the joy of receiving gifts gracefully for your stepdaughter. To be fair, some high school programs, think anything related to design, code, video editing, etc., do require certain software that only runs on newer laptops, or require Mac instead of PC. This isn't as common in high school as in college, but does exist. I don't know any schools that require PC but advanced courses at my public high school. Both schools I went to for undergrad and my grad school required a Mac that could run a certain version of software on it. Dad could also be thinking a newish MacBook now. We'll ask her through undergrad if it's taken care of properly. Why she needs a brand new Pro is beyond me. Refurbed ones will last just as long and can be $300 plus cheaper. However, that school. The kid has two parents to pay for school, and Opie isn't one of them. Opie's a bonus parent to this girl. She could include a nice case or keyboard protector or year of Microsoft Sweet and Kids Christmas gift, but is by no means responsible for this very expensive education-related tool. Kids' bio parents are being selfish a-holes. So not stay hole in my opinion, too. Yes, Mark was adamant on you so she could use it all through high school, six years, which I do agree on. The school supplies all the software needed, so I assumed the computers they suggested were needed for the specific software they needed. Edit. After reading the comments, I've decided to stick to my decision. I will offer $200 but won't pay more than that, and suggested cheaper options once again. I definitely agree that Sarah doesn't need that expensive of a laptop, but will suggest the MacBook Air. Any further comments would be much appreciated. Next story is titled... Am I the a-hole for not allowing my ex-mother-in-law to have a key to my house? So me and my ex have been separated for two years. We separated on good terms and we get on well despite our differences. We do have a three-year-old daughter, and he works a lot, so he doesn't get to have our daughter often. For this reason, I gave him a spare key to my house so that he could pop in and see us whenever he wanted. I completely trusted him with his key. For context, I have never had a good relationship with my ex-mother-in-law. She's always hated me and accused me of ruining her son's life by getting pregnant so young. I was 18. 
She hates me so much that when I was pregnant with our daughter, she threatened to take me to court to gain full custody of my daughter. When I found this out, I was of course furious and did confront her. They were empty threats, as I honestly think she knew she'd be fighting a lost battle. She despises me, and honestly, I'm not her biggest fan either. I haven't much interacted with her since I left my ex, except from the fortnightly visits where I take my daughter to her house. Well, my ex has been coming over to the house as usual, but has not been using his key. At first I thought nothing of this, but it became more frequent, and so I said if you're not going to use your key, I'll have it back. He then informed me that his mom had asked for the key so that she had access to the house, and to see her granddaughter whenever she wanted. He told me he agreed. I lost my temper completely. After everything I'd gone through in the past, I had absolutely no idea why he thought it would be a good idea to give his deranged mother my key. I told him I wanted it back immediately, and that I no longer wanted him to have a key. He is furious at me saying his mother is in pieces, as all she wants is to know that she can see her granddaughter whenever she so pleases. I told him that that was in no way realistic, and that if she wished to spend time with my daughter, she could message or call me and I'd bring her over with me there in attendance. This wasn't good enough and now him and his family are not speaking to me. So am I the a-hole? Now for the top comments. Not the a-hole. Start documenting these things. Exact dates, exactly what they do and say. This sounds like a course leading to a restraining order on the mother-in-law. Be prepared for that date. Stand your ground firmly on this issue. If he wants to invite her over while caring for his daughter, that's his choice. Giving her access to your home is a gross violation of trust, and you are right to revoke that access. Personally, don't ask for the key back. Just change the locks. It will give you peace of mind that you are safe again. I had started documenting back when she threatened custody, but stopped when we separated. I definitely think I should go back to it and continue it. Thank you. Can't emphasize enough about changing the locks. I'd also look into getting cameras as well. Time with his mother at this point needs to be only during his time with her and never on your property. Considering you didn't mention anything about a custody agreement, I'm guessing you only have an informal one. Might be time to consult an attorney about formalizing a legal one. If Grandma's feeling you are withholding her granddaughter through having normal boundaries, she likely is already looking into getting one for her son. Not stay home. Change your locks. She's likely made copies. Don't give him a key to the new lock. Locksmiths have been called. Feel like a fool for ever giving him one in the first place now. Don't. You did it because you were trying to do co-parenting. He is the one who broke your trust and is at fault. Not stay home. Most grandparents cannot see their grandkids whenever they want. They have to contact the parents and make arrangements to meet up. Your ex-mother-in-law wants that key for some other reason, and I doubt it is a good one. Get your locks changed. Even if you get that key back, they might have made a copy of it. It is not at all that expensive, even if you get a locksmith to do it. Or you can rekey the locks yourself if you are good at DIY. And I'd look for signs that someone has been in your house while you were out. She clearly wasn't using the key while you were home, but that doesn't mean she didn't snoop around while you were out. Update. Locksmith has been called. Glad I'm not going insane. Thank you all. Now for the last story. Am I the a-hall for alienating my daughter against her mother and allowing her to live with me? Context. My ex-wife Stacy and I, 37 male, met at a party in college and hit it off. We dated for three years during college. During the relationship, I made it clear I didn't want kids. Right after we graduated, Stacy got pregnant. She said it was caused by birth control failure. This is important for later. I didn't want the kid and tried to convince her to terminate or give the baby up for adoption, but she wanted to raise the kid. I really wanted to leave but felt guilty, so I married her out of guilt. After our daughter Madison was born, I started getting depressed. I became an alcoholic. I tried really hard to be a good dad to her. I really tried my best. When she was five, I realized how much I hated my life. I filed for divorce and left. I made sure to always pay child support. I still loved Madison, I just couldn't be a good parent to her at a time. I stayed in Chicago for a bit, but eventually moved to Canada for a job. Still, I felt like I had no purpose. I was still depressed, and I was still drinking. I was in a pretty dark place. I even lived in my car for three months. Then I met my current wife, Amanda, 33 female, and we started dating. She cared about me, and I started getting my life back on track. 
I left my toxic job, found a good apartment, started going to AA meetings, and started seeing a therapist. During this time, I contacted Stacy and asked to see medicine. I begged and showed her that I was sober, but she wouldn't let me. I tried several times, but Stacy wouldn't let me. I started a business six years ago, and it's done incredibly well in the last three years. It's pulled in three million in profit last year. Then Amanda and I got married. I was finally able to hire a good attorney, and after a complicated legal battle, I was given holidays and summers with Madison. Madison was a little difficult at first, but I have explained everything to her, and she was really understanding. Madison, 15 female, and I now have a really good relationship. I have tried to co-parent respectfully with Stacy, but she has been really difficult to communicate. She doesn't tell me certain matters, and she sends threatening voicemails, etc. I also know that Stacy told some pretty bad crap about me to Madison. Stacy told Madison I loved alcohol more than her, that I never sent them any money, despite the fact I never missed a payment. Two days ago, Madison called me and told me that she and her mother had a fight, and her mother admitted that she stopped taking birth control intentionally to trap me. Madison said that this was the last straw with her mom, and that she wants to move in with me. Madison said her mom was always mad at her for mentioning me, and that she forced her to share the stuff I got her with her step-siblings, and she begged me to let her move in. I obviously agreed. Legally, since she's 15, she can choose who to live with. Now my ex, her husband, and her family have been blowing up my phone telling me that I alienated Madison against her. Am I the a-hole? Not the a-hole. Oh no, the consequences of my actions. I have to laugh at them accusing Opie of alienating her. Opie didn't need to do anything since mom did a good enough job of that herself. Not today, home. You've turned your life around and started making amends with your daughter, which is exactly what a good father is supposed to do. Your ex not only lied to you about taking birth control to trap you, but she's been lying to your daughter for 15 years about you. And now she's pissed off because your daughter can see what a horrible manipulative person her mother is. Mom is and has been committing parental alienation, which is a huge no-no and would be another reason the courts would give Opie custody over to mom anyway. Mom is a nahal. She desperately wanted a child, and now that she has one, she is doing things to hurt her. Wow. How very sad for them all. Thank goodness Opie has turned his life around, gotten sober and is being a good father so that girl can have one responsible loving parent.